In this video we'll be covering chapter 21 section 1 which deals with uh, the nucleus and just to clarify some vocabulary as well as formatting to begin uh, we'll define what a nucleon is because we're going to be using that term a lot. And a nucleon is just a collective term for a proton and neutron. Similarly a nuclide is just another name for an atom in nuclear chemistry, usually because we're only looking at the nucleus of the atom, so we don't want to refer to the whole atom, including its electron cloud. Now, uh, as a matter of formatting, we can refer to uh, different nuclides a few different uh, ways, the first of which is through an abbreviated sort of uh, shorthand that involves writing its mass number, the number of nucleons it has, uh, up here, and its atomic number for the nuclide, in this case 88 for radium, down here. This could similarly be written simply as radium 228, because you can go to a periodic table and look up the atomic number for radium number 88. And this means that there's 228 total nucleons, of which 88 are protons because that's its atomic number. Moving on now to the concept of mass defect and nuclear stability, we'll start by looking at a helium-4 nuclei, which is written once again using the common formatting as 4He2. So in this case we have two protons and two neutrons that comprise a helium-4 nucleus with two electrons sort of floating about in this cloud out here. Now, you would expect that the total weight of this atom, that is the, the mass of the atom, would be equal, equal rather to the sum of its parts. So, you know, two protons plus two neutrons plus two electrons. But what you find is that the actual mass of a helium-4 atom is 4.0026. AMU. However, the sum of its parts is 4.0329 AMU. And this is not a small difference. I mean, this is a 0.3, or rather, 0 0.030 AMU difference. And this difference between the uh, expected value, that is, the sum of its parts that comprise it, and the total mass of the atom at 0 0.30 is what is known as the mass defect. And the mass defect is very helpful in determining the nuclear binding energy. And this is the energy required to create this, or the energy that was released rather, in the creation of this nucleus. Likewise, it is the energy required, then, to destroy the nucleus, that is, to send all the constituent parts flying away from one another. And it's really easy to determine the nuclear binding energy from the mass defect based on Einstein's equation that I'm sure you've all seen before, E equals mc squared. Now, you just take uh, the total mass defect, in this case, 0.30 AMU, oh that should be a 4 right there, 0 0.30 AMU, which is approximately 5.04 times 10 to the negative 29 kilograms, multiply by the speed of light, which is 3 times 10 to the negative 8 meters per second, square that, and you get a total binding energy of 4.54 times 10 to the negative 12 joules. And though that may not seem like a lot, remember you have to concentrate all that energy into the size of a nucleus. Now the nuclear binding energy is also useful for measuring uh, stability of a nucleus. For example, the higher the energy, the more stable, because if you have a higher binding energy, that means it will require more energy to break it up. Moving on now, we're going to be discussing uh, numbers of nucleons and nuclear stability. So over here we have a plot of the number of protons in a nucleus versus the number of neutrons in a nucleus. And you'll notice that it starts out at about a one-to-one -one ratio on this line over here. 
In other words, you know, when you have a small number of nucleons, it's about a one-to-one -one ratio between uh, protons and neutrons. However, when you get up into the higher numbers, the higher atomic numbers, it heads more towards uh, 1.5 to 1. And all this in here, between the 1.5 to 1 and the 1 to 1 ratio, is what is known as the band of stability. This is where most of the stable isotopes exist, you know, the ones that last thousands and thousands to uh, millions of years. However, uh, it's hard to explain this increase from 1 to 1 to 1.5 to 1 without understanding the forces on individual nucleons within the nucleus. So for example, if we have this poorly drawn nucleus over here in which the blue dots represent uh, positive protons and the gray dots represent neutrons, you can see that there's a lot of positive charge that builds up in the nucleus and naturally positive charges, like charges, want to repel one another. However, what's difficult to uh, see and we haven't covered very much is the actual uh, strong nuclear force pulling all of these nucleons in. Now if you want to learn more about this I suggest looking into uh, gluons and quantum chromodynamics but right now we're just going to say that there's at short ranges of about you know one to five uh, nucleon radii there's a super strong force which is known as the strong force pulling them together however as you add more positive uh, protons as you get and they get further and further away there's no longer the strong force acting between these two all you have is the electrostatic repulsion and keep in mind these are within one nucleus of one another so there's an extreme electrostatic repulsion Therefore, as you get higher and higher up in the uh, number of protons you have, you need more and more neutrons to sort of glue everything together, which is why you move towards this 1.5 to 1 number rather than the 1 to 1 number. Now, most stable nuclei exist with uh, even numbers of either neutrons, protons, or both. So because they're even, this suggests, uh, you know, they sort of pair off, much like electrons do, uh, within their shells, and this led to what is known as the nuclear shell model of the nucleus. And just as electrons exist in shells that have magic numbers 2, 8, uh, 18, etc., for the total number of electrons as you fill them and get to the noble gases, similarly, the nuclear shell model has magic numbers 2, 8, 20, 28, 50, 82, and 126. So nuclei that have these number of nucleons are extremely stable and not likely to radioactively decay. Lastly, we're going to be covering nuclear reactions, which are basically just uh, kind of self-explanatory. It's reactions that affect the nucleus of the nucleus of an atom. And so what you have to understand is that the more unstable nuclei in the periodic table undergo a spontaneous change. They, they will uh, change themselves to get more stable over time. And as a general rule for balancing these nuclear reactions, just with chemical reactions, you have to conserve mass, just, I mean, the law of conservation of mass doesn't go away just because we're dealing with the nucleus. However, you also have to conserve charge, which we've only done briefly sort of with the uh, redox reactions. So, for example, if we have the fusion of beryllium and helium, in this case we have beryllium-9 fusing with helium-4 to form carbon-12, and a neutron. You'll notice that the total mass number 
stays the same on either side. You have 9 plus 4 is 13 over here and 13 over here. Likewise, the proton number, so the total charge number, is 6 on the left and 6 on the right. And you don't change coefficients because uh, you're not usually reacting multiple nuclei simultaneously. However, you'll notice that we start off with beryllium and helium over here and change completely to a carbon as a product. And this process of changing one element into another is what is known as transmutation. And we'll look more at artificial transmutation as well as uh, transmutation in nuclear fusion later on.